Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. It is Claire. I would finally like to welcome you to chapter four of Aroids, Plants of the Arum Family by Danny Bown. This chapter, chapter four, is called Aquatics and Amphibians, Species of Wetlands and Water. Now the way that the information in this video is going to run is kind of the beginning. There's a lot of general information, then we cover a couple of the big genera in this group or these this kind of area of aroid dia, aroid dia, aro, arosea, aroids, forums. Um, and as the chapter progresses, we go less from information to, I guess, lists of various genera and species. So if you're here for information and like just fun, cool facts, first half of the video, if you're here for random lists of plants and Google pictures, then second half of the video, I assume. I don't know, I haven't filmed it yet. Flowers, well known of flowers, plants, right? They have worked very, very hard to survive on land. So they started off being real wet, real watery, real wet, and learnt to deal with soil and various other substrates and different conditions. But we have a bunch that just wanted to go back to the water, I suppose, and this is the group in the Aroid family that really wanted to be water plants. And I, the way I'm kind of explaining it makes it sound like these plants are kind of taking steps back in terms of evolutionary progress and achievement, but in order to readapt to aquatic life, it actually is quite complex. And even though it seems cyclical, it, it's another step forward again. I don't know, plants are crazy, man. Most of a plant is fine in water. So leaves, stalks, stems, roots, algae can adapt quite easily, can deal with being constantly wet. However, flowers can't or shouldn't. They don't do very well. If you remember chapter two, which was sexual mechanisms, I'm pretty sure we talked about uh, the inflorescence and the spathe and the spadix and the process of becoming ready for procreation. In that anthesis, the female stage is sticky wetness and the male stage is pollen, which is fluffy fluffness that also sticks to things. Neither of these <laughs> steps do very well if they get wet. The pollen will wash away and will not go where it needs to be. The receptive female flowers that are producing their sticky juices to catch said pollen are going to have a bit of a hard time if water's washing everything away. So flowers, water, not a great combination. And yet we have all these plants that are trying to do that. We, you will see in this video that a lot of plants don't rely on seed to reproduce. A lot of it is like vegetative, rhizomes, runners, that sort of thing. What is something that, fun little fact for some people, interesting little thing, for plants need water more than they need light. Oxygen diffuses more than a thousand times more slowly in water than in air. And it is in especially short supply in stagnant water and waterlogged substrates. So that, is why plants in soil cannot be constantly wet all the time or they will get root rot because the plant drowns and the roots rot because there is not the oxygen. Processes like hydroponics and aquaponics, on the other hand, are possible because it is moving water in a lot of cases or the plant is suspended, planted in a very 
airy substrate that can be easily oxygenated. So lecker is expanded clay, AKA lots of air gaps and holes. Perlite is, I saw somewhere someone described it as like silica popcorn, but it's very airy. We've got sphagnum moss, which yes, retains water extraordinarily well, but it's, I don't know, more than soil. Soil is just like suffocating. Water also makes photosynthesis harder because light has to then penetrate the water and it's diffused more. So a bit of a, bit of a difficulty here. Basically what we're trying to say is plants that favor aquatic life are just trying to make their lives really hard for themselves. Cause if that, if that water gets dammed up and if it goes stagnant, there's no oxygen, you're gonna die. If the water is dirty and you like being underwater, then you're not gonna get any light and you're gonna die. So you're just pretty screwed unless things are exactly as you need them to be. Transpiration rates are different when it comes to aquatics and a plant's willingness to transpire and lose water is different when they have a constant unending supply of water. And roots have less of a role of transferring water and nutrients to the leaves than soil plants because the leaves are also wet and roots are more, they serve the role more of anchors and like tethers to wherever the plant has decided to call home. Denny notes that very few genera of flowering plants have devised water repellent and buoyant pollen. So their flowers can open in the water and aquatics are still dependent on wind, insects, birds, those, you know, other things for fertilization and they can't use there, there's not evidence of plants being able to use water for fertilization in terms of transporting pollen to a receptive spadix. We have vegetative reproduction, which is through runners, through like offshoots, through cutting sort of, but like nature's cuttings. Where in the world are these things? Everywhere. So both aquatic and amphibians occupy a vast range of habitats from marshes and water margins, shallow pools and meandering streams to torrential waterfalls, mighty rivers and brackish estuaries and swamps. And they vary just as dramatically in form, which is kind of why as this video progresses, I give less and less detail on the smaller genera because Otherwise we would be here for hours. So I will, picture tells a thousand words and therefore I will not speak those thousand words. However, there are fewer limits to growth in wetlands than there are anywhere else. Soil, sand, volcano, tree. Many aquatics and amphibians are rich feeders able to utilize and neutralize potentially lethal levels of chemicals especially nitrogen, phosphorus, and heavy metals where runoff is from agricultural and industrial areas. So aquatic plants have adapted really, really well to everything we throw at them. And they are also really, really helpful in dealing with everything we throw at them at the environment. So get some aquatics if you are a um, human but be careful which one you get. The point of this, I suppose, is saying that wetlands, so like our marshes, like our swamps, like our tidal areas, they might seem like a, a waste of space, a gross little area that should be, you know, drained, filled in, used for agriculture, used for industry, used for residential areas, but they play a major role in nutrient cycles and lands only bulwark against dissolution and engulfment. Really, really useful. Keep our wetlands safe and in use, please, so that we don't kill everything else. 
All right, getting into some of the types of aquatic aroids. The probably the biggest maybe, <laughs> which is hilarious because they are the smallest groups of aroids are known as duckweeds. Now they are tiny, tiny, tiny little aquatic plants that group together and form kind of like a green film or a mat on the surface of the water. Um, if you're anything like me and you know nothing about uh, plant life and water life, you would probably just think it's like algae or something because if it's green and if it's in water, it's either seaweed or algae, right? It is to me. <laughs> um, but it looks like surface scum, so it's kind of like gross and dirty. But it is very useful for a lot of things. But it is our first example of something that doesn't, of a plant that doesn't multiply or rely on seed because it's so small wind can carry them away, they can get caught to animals, they can get caught on boats, they can get caught on people, and then they are dispersed and they multiply that way. And they, like you're not ever gonna find one duckweed. So strength in numbers, huge, huge, like millions and millions, but they're tiny, tiny, tiny. So it, it's just a film, like we said earlier. So thousands or millions. They're really, really useful for waterways because they can reduce temperature fluctuations, the evaporation rate, light, oxygen in the water, and they can increase the content of organic matter by lowering the rate of decomposition. So this is all really, really useful stuff if you want a thriving ecosystem in your wet area. If you want abundant fish, if you want other swimmy things, if you want other plant life, this will ensure that you have a stable environment for them. And there are more than 40 species of insects that feed or develop on duckweeds. So really important for the animal kingdom as well. So we have tiny, tiny little duckweeds. And then the other big group of aquatic aroids are Water lettuce or pistia. Pistia? I think it's pistia. For example, like that's the genera. Species in particular we're referring to is Pistia stratioides, I assume. It is kind of, well, it's called water lettuce because it's green and it kind of looks like lettuce. But the thing about pistia that you have to be careful is. Apparently, it's attractive. I don't really see it, but some there are people who have liked it so much so that it has spread around the world, both in cultivation and consequently in nature, because things that are in cult cultivation don't often stay isolated to cultivation, especially if it is a fast multiplying plant such as pistia. So in Australia, in Queensland specifically, pistia have actually been given weed status. They have been considered a serious weed. If you decide that you really want one and you just love the look of it and it just, it just needs to be something that you own, check your local council, check your state, territory, country, plant laws, and see if you're actually allowed to have them, or if you could get fined more than they're worth. However, all is not lost when it comes to Pistia, because they could potentially be used in sewage treatment. So they prefer nutrient rich, slow moving or stationary water. So, you know, they can clean up some gross things, but they could also be used as fertilizer, potentially, if they need to be. Other groups of aquatics and amphibians include Montricardia, 
So they're tall, wood, slender, stemmy things. One species has spines on the stems, one species doesn't. Their seeds are like the size of a walnut, and I don't know how big a walnut is, so... Some size. We've got Lassia, so Lassia spinosa. We've got Pycnospatha, is how I'm gonna say it. I don't know if that's correct. Eurospatha, Dracontioides, Certosperma, Lassimorpha, Anaphylopsis, Yasarum or Yasarum, depends on how you pronounce things. Prior to becoming obsessed with Brandon Sanderson, I would have said Yasarum, but now I see it and I say Yasarum. Oh. No, I don't know because Yasarum is the only submerged aquatic aroid in the Neotropics. So that's kind of America, or South America or the New World or whatever you want to call it. But the Asian tropics have more than 70 species of submerged aquatics. The South American species is Yasarum styomachii. And apparently it is closely related to Caladium. And it's thought to evolve from caladiums, but something that Denny mentions a lot in this chapter is this species and this other group probably were growing all real close together and then the continent split. It's all very dramatic. It's not that dramatic. I'm just, I'm just making it dramatic. But there is a strange, somewhat inexplicable distribution and weird, weird, weird similarities even weirder differences between a lot of these genera that cannot be explained unless we look at potential historical events that have influenced life. And then we get on to rheophytes. So rheophytes are plants of the current which sounds very uh, formal and fancy, but essentially they live in currents. So apparently they can survive in swift currents, one to two meters a second, um, or three to six feet if you're a feet person, and they experience and can deal with flash flooding. So it's just, it's very variable is what I'm trying to say. Um, so in order to combat this, rheophytes generally have very, very narrow, flexible, they're literally streamlined because the stream current goes through them, leaves so that they can not be swept away as easily. And then they have very large and tenacious root systems. And they also need to respond rapidly to low water levels, so they need to flower and germinate quickly if they want successful reproduction through seed. Um, because as we said earlier, flash flooding will inhibit the ability of a plant to successfully flower and reproduce using traditional methods. But whether uh, species could be can be described as a rheophyte depends on observing it in the wild. So you'd need to look at where it's located. You'd need to look at the leaves and the water, not the yeah, well yeah, the water and the roots, and make a decision from there. Like I can't put a streamlined leaf or a or a crazy crazy root system on a plant in a pond and go that's a rheophyte because that's not its natural habitat. I don't actually know if it's a rheophyte, but they're not specific to any select genera. Apparently there are some in Homolomina, there are some in Anthurium, uh, but most belong to a lot of little small groups like Anubius, Holoclamus, and the Shish, Shishmataglotid group or shishmaglottis. Apparently there's like 100 to 120 species of shishmaglottis and they're found around Asia. Other potential 
Reophytic Aroid Genera. Hi Styles, how are you doing? Include, we've got Heteroaridarum Bucephalandra. I'm assuming that's named after Alexander the Great's horse, Bucephalus. I don't know though. Uh, we've got Phymat Phymatarum, Hotarum, Aridarum, Piptospatha, Holoclamus, which I mentioned earlier, Anubius, I mentioned earlier, Laganandra, Cryptocorin, apparently. And then the aroid that has conquered tidal reaches is Agliodorum, so specifically Agliodorum griffithii. Uh, Griffithii is a common species name amongst multiple genera in the Aroid family. There's a lot of repeats and names and if you are big into your land Aroids, you might draw the connection between Agliodorum and Aglaonema. They're, they're pretty similar apparently, but I don't know much of anything about Ag Agliodorum. Then we get to skunk cabbages. These, so we've got water lettuce, we've got duckweeds, we've got skunk cabbages. Great names, great names here. Um, but apparently they're called, the, like there's like three species that can fall under skunk cabbage and they're called skunk cabbages because they smell like skunks and overcooked cabbage, not because they look like a skunk cabbage. Not that I know what a skunk, skunk and a cabbage hybrid would look like. So Lysiciton, 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 I don't know, Simplicarpus fall under skunk cabbage. Other aquatic and amphibious aroids include Orontium, Calla, Xanted, Deshia, also known as pig lily, apparently because people would feed it to pigs, but it's also an ornamental and people get the cut flowers a lot. Other aroid genera of mention are Peltandra and Typhonodium, Typhonodium, but a difference from the first edition of this book to the second edition of this book was the removal of the Acorus genus from the Aroid family. It's still a monocot. If you are familiar with plant classification, but again, I'm not gonna go into that now. It's, so it's still a monocot, a flowering plant, but it is no longer considered to be an Aroid. I just felt like a really long list, but I'm going to now, I'm just gonna sum up, finish by reading the, I guess the last paragraph slash passage from this chapter in which Denny kind of concludes by saying, tree like Montricardia and Typhonodorum, floating Pistia and the duckweeds, tidal flowering cryptocorin and ice breaking simplocarpus. To such extremes have arrows gone in pursuit of wetland niches where the necessities of life are viable and the competition reduced. They have stopped short only at the open sea and the tundra. Relatively few have ventured far from the tropics, but those that have, the aquatics and amphibians have gone furthest south and north. Spiridella and Lemna occur in southernmost South America and Lysichiton, Lysichiton and Kala advancing on the Arctic Circle. Thanks so much for watching chapter four of Aroids Plants of the Aurum Family by Denny Baum. I hope you learned something. Let me know if you own any aquatic aroids or you are like exclusively into aquatic aroids. I will see you next time in the next video and hopefully chapter five will not be as long a wait as chapter four was. Again, apologies for that, but also 
not. Sorry. Like this video if you like things. Comment about stuff if you have thoughts in your head and <laughs> subscribe if you have an account because that's a nice thing to do. Anyway, I'll see you next time. Thanks for sticking with me. Bye.